in going around and uh, introducing ourselves. And so why don't we do that now? Um, if we want to start, how about, oh, no, well, go to the other side. Let you finish your, your mouthful. Uh, okay, how about we start at this end? Um, since it's a big crowd, if you, just say your name and what state you're from. Uh, I think that would be enough. And uh, we'll, we'll start in the, with the, this table. Okay, I'm Barbara Dean. No, no, the, the back table. Behind oh, the back. Sorry, I the back one. <laughs> <laughs> the table back oh, there, you know. Okay. What can I say? Kathy. Okay, could you stand up so people could see you? Kathy, okay. I'm from Minnesota. Tom Lloyd, Minnesota. Okay. Speak up. Yep. Uh, John O'Kogo with uh, in Minnesota. Tom Curtis, Wisconsin. H. Bell Dickens, Washington. Dave Anderson, Minnesota. Okay. William Dean, Minnesota. <laughs> Barbara Dean, Minnesota. Gary Babcock, Minnesota. Emily Fuller, Minnesota. Jackie DeVore, Minnesota. James Tutonico, Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania. Mitchell Winning, Minnesota. Ann Olson, Minnesota. Great, right, how about, oh, back. Oh. Thomas Seberg, Minnesota. Okay, thanks, Tom. Gary Miller, New Jersey. Ed Green, Florida. Colin Phelps, Florida. Denise Frischer, Minnesota. Charlie, Oregon. Okay, Myra. Huh? <laughs> Can I help? Nope. <laughs> Myra Close, Utah. Connie Hill, Utah. <clears throat> Owen Cram, Utah. Carol Hartwig, Utah. Betty Hurd, Utah. Okay. Richard Rubin, Delaware. I'm Rick Lemire, and I'm not from Minnesota. I'm from Delaware. <laughs> <laughs> proud of it. <laughs> Marjorie Gilsworth, and I am from Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. Oh, I get the conversation going. Stephanie <laughs> <laughs> Ibarra, <Ibarra>, Minnesota. <laughs> Richard Yankee, Arizona. Deanna Moreau, Arizona. <clears throat> Carla? No, I'm not a stand-up. Yeah. No. Huh? I'm Carla Burr from Virginia. Rita Lothar, <coughs> Oregon. Don Baker, Ellen Stivani, New Jersey. Okay. Yep. Uh, Sharon Bishop, Spokane, Washington. Tara Rollins, Utah. Dina Hill, Colorado. Island Park, Washington State. Uh, Kathy Pfizer, Colorado. Okay. Claudia Frost, New York. You can tell that on your voice. Not <laughs> Minnesota. At Ryan, New York. Okay. Yeah, you don't have the accent that Claudia does. That's what Tina Darbeau, Kansas. The Royals. <laughs> okay, and once again, I'm Tim Sheehan. I live in San Diego area, California. And I want to introduce uh, Dave Anderson again to start our first presentation. Hello? Hello? Is this working? Yes. Yeah. Oh, it's sort of working. Is it working better now? I'll just attach it to my cheek. Okay, so our first topic of the day is leadership, and we thought a good way of kind of loosening ourselves up for the, the day and for this conversation is to ask if uh, people wanted to share, if they have this, one sentence that for them sums up the role of leadership. And I don't know if I'm putting people on the spot, but uh, if there's anything people would want to share on kind of right as, as we get into this topic about what's important to them about leaders or the role of leadership. Yes. Example of service. Example of service. Yes. Delegation. Delegation. Pride. Pride. People have a, yes. Integrity. Integrity. 
charisma. Charisma. Other thoughts you want to share about? Yes. It's a little, little hard to say in one word. Oh, or or one sentence. I'm sorry if I said one word. It could be one sentence. Assessing people and putting in putting them in positions where they can be successful. Yes. Planning. Pardon me. Planning. Planning. Other thoughts people want to share about leadership. I missed one. <laughs> well, um, if we wanted to move on to the next slide, the basic Oh, I guess uh, technically we have to uh, switch in. We can keep talking. Okay, I, okay so uh, the good news is you're all right. Uh, all of those are important uh, dimensions of leadership uh, because leadership isn't just one thing. Leadership is what's needed uh, at this moment, whatever the moment is, uh, for an issue, for an organization, or for the people that you're responsible for leading. Uh, could we go to the next slide? So what I'd like to do though is encourage people to think about uh, leadership uh, as something that's, that is based in context where you do have to be conscious of uh, for the issue, for the organization, for uh, the individuals that you're leading, what is it uh, that's going on and what kind of leadership is important to provide at this point? Uh, and what at, at, at the issue level, so whether that's uh, something that's confronting your uh, specific community or your state or uh, the nation overall, whether it's a legislative issue or an organizing issue or, or whatever the issue might be, um, it's important to uh, understand uh, if it's something that is within your existing experience, something that you are working with on a regular basis, uh, and you may just need to adapt to the particular uh, circumstances in that at that time. That uh, for a technical issue may be something that uh, you do regular, say, fundraising events. Uh, you have a uh, where's uh, is Terry here? Uh, I know they have a um, a regular fundraising event uh, where I think it's a, a day of the races, and how they do that event may change from year to year. Uh, but it's something that's within uh, their existing knowledge. It's, uh, they probably have a standard process that they approach that, and they may just need to make small changes from year to year based on what kinds of donations they get for the fundraising event, if they change venues. But it's basically something that they're familiar with, they have expertise with, um, and they just have to make small adaptations to the regular process they have in order to be successful with it. Then there are a whole other category of, of issues that are really calling on you to make an adaptation of some kind to how you exercise leadership and how your organization operates. For instance, uh, some of the kinds of changes that we in Minnesota certainly recognized at different points in time are, say, changing demographics. There are any number of communities that I could mention that at one point were 95% uh, white and now are two-thirds people of color. Uh, most of those uh, people of color being uh, Latinos who are recent Im immigrants, uh, where uh, English may not be their uh, uh, first language. Um, and so at the beginning, we responded to this, we responded to this challenge as kind of a technical issue. You know, we knew what the issues were, we know what issues residents are confronted by, and it's just getting over the language barrier. So we translated materials, uh, the same materials uh, from English into Spanish, uh, we uh, arranged for interpreters if we had meetings where we knew there would be a lot of people who were most fluent in Spanish. And we just sort of approached it at that level as kind of a, a technical issue to overcome. But we recognized uh, over time that it was a deeper adaptive challenge, that, uh, that there had to be changes in uh, just not the outside world of, well, how are we presenting our, our materials and, and do we have a good way of translating? Uh, but some of our internal attitudes and some of the processes and procedures that were, we were using that, for instance, one of the things that we discovered was uh, that um, 
particularly uh, Latino immigrants, have all the same issues plus. Uh, the, there's a report uh, from a number of years ago that we, where we documented uh, uh, how widespread uh, housing discrimination was, where not only were they were Latino uh, residents running into the same issues uh, with unresponsive management or the risk of communities being closed, but they were also being uh, denied uh, tenancy, even though there were vacancies, they were being steered toward the less desirable homes or the less desirable uh, communities. Uh, if if there was someone who owned a number of communities in the same area, so what we discovered is uh, it took us uh, thinking a little more deeply, and it wasn't just a matter of well, let's just you know make sure that people can read our materials, but understanding but recognizing that our understanding of the issues that we were confronting and what we needed to do also needed to change. Uh, so that's one example. Another we ran into was just uh, the issue of uh, uh, communities making a transition from investor ownership uh, to resident ownership, which, you know, on, on the one hand, it could be approached very much as just an issue. Uh, so uh, rename the park. Uh, work with people who have technical expertise in loan applications to apply for the loans, to structure the legal documents in order to transfer the ownership, uh, uh, to line up the financing. Um, but when you think about it, uh, you're going from a situation where uh, resident, where homeowners living in an investor-owned community have basically two responsibilities. Pay your rent, follow the rules. And that's, you can aspire to more than that, but under that setup, that's all you're really legally required to do. As a resident owner, on the other hand, uh, you're going from that kind of role to having some say, uh, potentially uh, the most direct say if you end up being elected to the board of that cooperative and managing a multi-million dollar operation where you have to facilitate collective decision making around all the same kinds of tough decisions that existed before but now you have to get uh, your neighbors to go along with those decisions even if they don't agree with them. So if there's someone uh, living in your community that everyone uh, likes, that seems like a, a nice guy, but you know he's not following the rules, he's not paying his rent, uh, then uh, getting to a place where you can ex uh, exercise that kind of collective leadership and have people accept that well, the rules are the rules, and sometimes people do need to be evicted. That's easier um, to accept, if not like, necessarily like, when it's an outside party, uh, when it's your neighbors uh, having to make a decision like that. Then that's where it becomes not just a technical issue, but really kind of adapting uh, to uh, how you've operated as a community uh, to a whole uh, different way of doing things or rent increases, which may be a more common issue of having, uh, of changing how you operate so that you can bring people along, uh, even if they don't like it, uh, with the idea of a rent increase. Um, so, so that's thing number one, in terms of just the issues, recognizing that there are technical issues, uh, but then there are also adaptive challenges, uh, where you, in the case of uh, changing demographics, where you may have had the power of numbers at one point, um, and now those numbers have shifted and you either figure out how to work with what's now the majority of your community and retain the power of numbers or you go into decline because you lose that ability or uh, making that transition from an investor owned community to a resident owned community uh, but not figuring out how to change how you're exercising leadership and having a situation where there's just a lot of struggles and back and forth and there is one uh, resident-owned community in Minnesota, one of the first, that actually um, it had some financial challenges from the very beginning. It was an investor-owned community, it became a resident-owned community, it went into foreclosure, uh, and now it's a, an investor-owned community again. Um, and the challenges that led it through that arc uh, were kind of some of the larger financial challenges that they were dealing with from the very beginning. But all along, there was a lot of shifting back and forth. First, uh, one faction of the park would be in charge of the board, then there'd be an election, and then it would be a different faction of the board. And they were all, whoever it was that made up that board of directors of that 
uh, resident co-op had exactly the same problems that they didn't create, uh, but they were trying to do their best to respond to, uh, to deal with. Um, but they suffered from the fact that they were very divided as a community. So um, just, just the assumption that uh, there's a silver bullet, and once uh, a community is resident owned, all of the problems go away, and everyone lives in harmony together, uh, is, is taking kind of the technical mindset of all we have to do is just restructure things differently and everything will work fine. Uh, but really it is an adaptive challenge where you have to think about uh, attitudes, behaviors, processes. You have to rethink everything in order to figure out how to make it a success. Uh, and just uh, going to the next slide. So just to under, underscore a few things about uh, adaptive leadership. So as I was saying, uh, most problems uh, and, and most issues that you confront are more than likely uh, technical issues where it's just an extension of what you've already been doing. It's how your organization is already set up to operate. Uh, you just have to do what you know how to do uh, and make the small little tweaks uh, in order to be successful. Um, but when you do run into those issues that are clearly uh, more than just a process change but an adaptive change, then you have to be prepared to look at your attitudes, values, behaviors, uh, do, are there things that, that are more fundamental that underlie uh, your procedures that are going to have to change? Um, and to also be aware that the deeper the change, the stronger the resistance, that there can be a very, especially if, if, you're, if there's something really fundamental, like you went from being a community that was almost entirely white to now a community that's uh, uh, primarily uh, people of color, and you're, you're still the same set of people as, as leadership, or you were in an investor-owned community, now you're resident-owned, uh, where there, there may be very deep changes that people, out of that resistance uh, to having to change, uh, may decide, well, um, let's, you know, basically let's kill the messenger. Uh, if we can just shut up the person uh, that's telling us that we've got this bigger problem and we have to change fundamentally, then maybe we don't have to make big fundamental chains, changes. And so the word of advice there is even though it's sometimes easier or more comfortable to try and make those big changes with a small group, the smaller you make the group, the easier it is to kill the message. Uh, and the easier it is for the, the rest of your community or the rest of your organization to just push you out uh, if they decide that the change is just too difficult and they don't want to deal with it. Um, and really what that's about is recognizing that if, you're, if it's an organization or a community and you have a problem, uh, even though as a leader you may feel responsibility to solve that problem, it's not really your problem. It's the entire organization's problem. It's the entire community's problem. And you may actually feel sort of rewarded for taking it on to your own shoulders. The people may say, oh, you're such a great leader. You're so valuable. No one can do what you can do. And they may encourage you to basically walk out on that plank all by yourself. And they may do it with praise and admiration. And then when it gets too hard, uh, it will push off of the, uh, off of the, 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 the plank and you're in the ocean by yourself. Um, so if, if it's your organization or your community or your people broadly defined that have the problem, they have to be the people who also come up with and own the solution. Uh, because otherwise, it gets too hard, it gets too uncomfortable. It feels too much like you're changing from what you were into something that you're not sure that you really want to be. And they can try and make the, the need to, they can try and at least quiet down the discussion of change by getting rid of you. So don't, don't or your small group of people. So don't let yourself be put into that position if you recognize that this is really a larger issue that the entire community or the entire group needs to solve. Um, and there are models out there, and at the very end of this presentation, which is also in uh, your books, I, I uh, mentioned some uh, resources that you can refer to. Uh, but one of them talks about a model for adaptive leadership in four parts. Uh, it talks about uh, creating a holding environment, which is a very strange phrase, but basically what it means is once you can get a recognition from your entire community or your entire organization that there needs to be a change, uh, then don't just let it run sort of wild uh, in your organization or community, but create a setting in which you deal with it. So it may be a committee, it may be a specific timeline, it may be a series of community votes, um, but create a structure for how you're going to 
deal with that issue. So, you know, once you get people to appreciate that there's something really significant that needs to change, it just, yeah, this doesn't break out randomly in every setting, but you have a process uh, that you all can agree on to deal with that issue. Uh, a second is they talk about controlling the temperature. So one, one reaction that people who often find themselves in leadership roles, especially if you find yourself as kind of a, a caretaking leader, uh, is to try and bring down the temperature. That, you know, this is a really serious situation. I don't want people to freak out. Uh, so I'll bring down the temperature on this, uh, which you can sometimes overdo. And in, instead of making it easier for people to manage a stressful situation, uh, you can convince people that there's no stress at all, and in fact, it's not all that urgent, and really we don't need to deal with it at all. So you don't want people freaking out, um, but you want people to feel enough of the pressure and enough of the heat that something needs to happen that they're motivated, because com comfortable people don't change. Um, you know, if, if, if you can manage a situation, even if it's not ideal, you continue to manage it. So it's, it's trying to be conscious of, of the temperature not being so high that people are freaked out um, and just bolt out the door or completely, completely withdraw, but not trying to so uh, uh, caretake other people that you minimize the temperature so much that people uh, begin to uh, misperceive the situation and think, well, I guess it's not serious. I guess we don't need to do anything. Uh, setting the pace, I guess that goes along with kind of creating that environment where you're going to make the decision where part of the environment is is figuring out a reasonable pace at which people can understand the situation, make decisions about what needs to change, and make those changes uh, so that it moves along and you don't just get stuck in what people sometimes call analysis paralysis, where you just study the problem and study it, study it some more, study what you've studied come up with a summary of every uh, conclusion that you came to while you were studying, um, you can just endlessly get caught in that loop. So you do have to set a pace for yourself so that you're you're actually moving forward. Uh, uh, although at a realistic pace that you, you know uh, people can handle without it boomeranging back on you and people uh, going into that mode of just wanting to shut down and, and not deal with the issue. And then uh, it all, uh, the resource also talks about showing everyone the future. So giving people an idea of not just why, what the problem is that, that they're confronting, but what um, as a result of managing the situation well. So you know, what would that mean uh, if the population of the park has changed and we're successful in reaching out to and engaging them? What, what could be the benefit of that? Or uh, if we figure out how to make decisions well as a, as a community, uh, now that we're a resident-owned community, what, what can that mean? What, uh, so giving some inspiration, making sure people know that there's uh, not just light at the end of the tunnel, uh, but potentially a very good uh, uh, alternative. So uh, if we could move on to the next slide. So I guess this is where uh, I start to go just a little grin happy, and I apologize for that, but I wanted to try and keep it short and hopefully provide this as a resource that people could maybe refer to uh, every so often. Uh, and this is kind of the shift from thinking about leadership in terms of the issue, in terms of thinking about leadership in terms of the organization. That given what the issue might be or what the challenge might be, uh, then the response might be very different. Uh, and uh, often it's broken down into the idea of sort of the structure of the organization. Is that where the leadership needs to be exercised? Is it human resources? Is it the people uh, within the organization and how they're being treated within the organization? Is it a political issue raging within the organization? Or is it a need, uh, uh, as is described under the symbolic leadership, is it, is it a need to just be reminded uh, why all of this is important and why we're all together on this? And What's great, and, and some of the resources that I, I suggest at the end are, uh, uh, in this case, it, it suggests metaphors that I think are really helpful to understanding how this uh, leadership works with a very specific image. So in the case of structural leadership, that's sort of thinking of things kind of like a factory. That it's, a, it's about the structure. It's about the rules and roles and goals and path policies, kind of the basic structure that makes up your organization. And the real challenge there is making sure that the form follows the function. So 
if you uh, have a state uh, homeowner association and you've identified that the <coughs> most important purpose of that homeowner association is to provide uh, whatever it is. Maybe you decide that the most important purpose is to provide support for other communities to get organized. Well, then in theory, how you would set up your organization and how you would define roles within your organization would be to support that. On the other hand, if you decide that the most important function is to focus on uh, legislative change at your state capital, then you'd probably structure your organization in a very different way to support that. But the worst of both worlds is if those were the two things you were deciding between and uh, you decided, well, the legislative work is really what we're here uh, to do, why we exist, and that's why we have set up, that's why we put all of our money into a, running a tenant hotline. Well, you may have mismatched slightly, uh, or maybe not, maybe there's a logical reason for that, but it's uh, potentially possible that you've mismatched the structure of your organization and what it is that you're set up to do. Uh, so that's uh, one example. Um, in terms of uh, the HR or human resources leadership, um, a lot of people will use the metaphor or the image of, of an organization as a family, where you take a, a deep concern about the people who are involved in the organization and what skills they have and whether the needs of the organization and the needs of the people are really lined up or not. So for instance, if uh, you're deciding that a really big, that you, you want your state HOA to grow and what's really important to that is increasing fundraising and so you put the expectation on all of your leaders that they're going to be out there and do doing more uh, fundraising then kind of from, kind of from the uh, HR leadership uh, uh, frame looking at that leadership for your organization in that context uh, a great way of aligning the organization's needs and your, the needs of the people in your organization would be to plan for fundraising training. So instead of just uh, say establishing the priority and putting the responsibility on people and just assuming success uh, and maybe, you know, maybe lots of encouragement, figuring out is there some way that you can uh, get people together, uh, provide training, or uh, lay out very simply in materials that they could look at on their own uh, here's a good way to be successful. Here's here's how to uh, have a successful ask for a donation for a silent auction, or to apply for a grant, or to get other people, other uh, homeowners to join as members. But to just think about if you're if you've set a priority for the organization and you're counting on people carrying it out, are you supporting people in a way that will make them successful in carrying out what that uh, purpose is uh, for the organization? Political leadership. Uh, you know, a lot of the work that we do is, is very political. Uh, we're uh, pushing for uh, local public policy changes, state public policy changes, national public policy changes, and we may not all agree on what exactly is the right change to make. Um, so the challenge here is to develop a clear agenda and, to, uh, clear, and a base of power to basically uh, have consensus among your leadership and your members and to get people behind it and committed to it. So for instance, if you were thinking about policies that would make it easier to transition uh, investor-owned communities to resident-owned communities, there are a lot of approaches for how to do that. In Minnesota, we have a right of first refusal that applies to just when communities are being sold for redevelopment, uh, but other states like uh, New Hampshire uh, have a negotiate in good faith law where any time a uh, park is up for sale, uh, they have to entertain an offer from the residents if the, if the residents are interested in making an offer. Other states, they don't have a, a mandated opportunity for the residents to weigh in and attempt to buy the park, but they do have a requirement that uh, whenever a sale is being entertained, that the residents are made aware of that, uh, and they're allowed to make an unsolicited off offer, uh, but the uh, community owner isn't required to accept it, but there's a, a tax incentive if they do, where they uh, can get a reduction in their capital gains taxes if they choose to send, sell to the residents, uh, to the homeowners, as opposed uh, to someone else. So each of those are very different approaches to get to the same goal, uh, and you may have internal division within uh, your leadership or, or your membership about which is the right way to go. And so in that case, 
the challenge is political leadership to figure out how to help people through making a decision uh, that could pull them in a lot of different directions and then keep people together and motivated and keep that power of numbers even though the alternative for how to pursue that goal may not have been some people's first choice. It may have been their third choice. Um, but the, the, the challenge is recognizing that there could be those political disagreements within your organization or community and figuring out how to keep, keep people together. And then symbol, symbolic leader, leadership, and I think this is often the most neglected uh, but the most important kind of leadership. It's the, the kind of leadership that uh, people often use the image of uh, church or temple or uh, as a metaphor for because it's what provides a sense of purpose and meaning to everything that you're doing, and it often comes out in the form of stories. That if you can, if you can, and organizations often have these stories at the at the heart of their community or their organization anyway, um, and they, they just uh, are don't often enough think about that and make use of those. That people are very are very much reminded about. Uh, why, why they exist as an organization, why they got organized as a community, if they can be reminded of the challenges that they faced and the successes that they had in overcoming those challenges. If that can provide the inspiration, it can provide the reminder, it can give people a sense of uh, why they're attempting all of this. Um, if we could go to the next slide. All right. Um, so, sort of a, a brief uh, step uh, in transitioning to talking about uh, leadership for uh, the people within your organization as opposed to thinking of it at that high level of, of the issue or the organization. Um, there are several different approaches uh, that you can take in terms of leadership, uh, but they tend, to fall, they, they tend to fall somewhere on the spectrum between uh, more resonant leadership, basically leadership that where you resonate, where you basically you get yourselves on the same wavelength and it draws you closer together. And there are forms of leadership that are more on the dissonant side, more on the static side of the spectrum, where you're on di different wavelengths, you clash, and as a result, uh, you move, end up moving further apart. Um, which, you know, I think we all instinctively, intuitively uh, understand that, um, but it doesn't necessarily play out in how when it's one-on-one -on -one leadership that we're exercising for people. Uh, and I think that's where problems sometimes develop. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. So having said that there, there's a spectrum, there are some forms of leadership that are valuable, but they are more on the dissonant side of the spectrum. They do tend to create more static between the leader and, and the person or the people that they're leading. Uh, and not to dismiss them, because every form of leadership is valid, uh, and it's just to be aware of how much and when you use it. And I think in terms of the command and pace setting, I think those are probably what people most often, that most people most often think of as leadership. In some cases it's, for some people it can be all they think of as leadership. The command, you know, the command style of leadership, where it's someone who basically knows what needs to be done and they tell people what to do. Uh, and it can be incredibly valuable uh, if people are in a crisis. That you know, if if you're in a room and the room is on fire, you need someone to exercise command leadership. You need to just say, "I've spotted the the safe exit. Everybody go that direction." You don't need to go through a, a long deliberative process. You need someone who can recognize what needs to be done in that crisis and direct people. In those um, cases. It, you know, it suits fear, it reassures people, it gives people a sense of what uh, they need to do in a situation where people often are really unsure. Um, or peace setting, uh, of just um, realizing that there's a lot of things that need to get, get done and people just need to keep up the pace in order to get it accomplished. Um, that can be very good if everyone's motivated, you, you share the goal, everyone has the skills that they need to have, um, and they're, they're all really committed to achieving that, that, that end and they're prepared for it. Um, but both of these, if they're exercised too often or in the wrong settings, it can create that distance and that static in between people. That if in a day-to-day -day situ situation they come into an organization and they're just told what to do, 
Well, they're volunteers. They don't work there. They're they're not dependent on that uh, for uh, income. Uh, if they if they feel that they're that they're not listened to, that they're just told what to do in a day-to-day -day situation, uh, you can create that that kind of distance and. Uh, people can just decide not to be involved or uh, peace setting if it's if it's dealt with in a situation where it's not really appropriate people aren't really prepared for it they're really not bought into the goal that they're told to work 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 uh, that's often the kind of leadership that if it's overused it can lead to burnout when people talk about burnout it's often uh, has to do with peace setting where they just work really hard really fast all the time, often when they don't feel like they've been adequately prepared to do what they're being asked to do. Um, so just to keep that in mind, this can be incredibly valuable uh, in, the, in the command style, uh, when there needs to be a quick turnaround, uh, when things need to happen quickly, when there's a crisis, when there's a need for a quick response or pace setting, when you've got everyone prepared and bought in and you just need to work quickly towards the goal. Um, but, you know, to be cautious. Um, can we go to the next slide? Uh, so this slide and the next talk about four uh, uh, styles of leadership that are more on the resident end that tend to bring people closer together, uh, that tend to um, put people more on the same uh, wavelength. So one is visionary, and and like uh, with the command and the pace setting, uh, visionary can be overused. Um, it, it tends to bring people together, um, but it's most useful uh, when you're uh, when you have a need for a new vision when the direction forward is unclear that's a way to bring people together uh, to get them on the same page to uh, invite uh, them to share what's important to them but also to lay out for them a clear uh, vision of the future it can be overused obviously if, uh, if you're constantly just laying out dreams and you're never getting into the pragmatic side of things but it can be something that especially to be you know to be aware of are we moving into a new area where you know we've never been uh, a resident community before or we were only a local organization and we've never lobbied at the capital before uh, if you're moving into something entirely new then it can be incredibly powerful for you to have in your organization people in the leadership who can really demonstrate vision and an understanding of why this can have a broader payoff. Uh, coaching, I think that's pretty um, clear, is that uh, people uh, join organizations often not just to support the uh, goals of the organization, but because they have goals for themselves as well, that they, that they want to become better public speakers, they want to get to know their neighbors, they want to uh, have the experience of going down to the Capitol and lobbying. Um, there are even those rare individuals who want to join a board of directors. Um, uh, and, and hopefully we all uh, want uh, more of them. Um, so in, th in that case, it's, you know, uh, recognizing that people have uh, visions of their own for themselves and figuring out how to uh, try to meet them part way with, with what helps them to, to meet the goals they have for themselves. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Uh, affiliative. Uh, so, you know, a, a affiliation is basically the root word of this. It's um, uh, establishing close relationships with people. Um, and I think in our organizations, in our communities, we probably recognize that there are people who fill this this role, even if we don't think consciously of it. They're the people that uh, that just seem naturally uh, to develop uh, friendships and relationships and trust and communication with uh, people in that community. The people who, you know, if you asked everybody uh, who would they like to plan a birthday party with, uh, everybody's in, in many communities or organizations, you'll find that an awful lot of people end up picking the same person. And it's that, that person who has that ability to just connect well on a personal level with other people. It may not necessarily be in service of a specific goal if, if, if you're not conscious of that as a form of leadership. It may just be that, you, that, that you're, you're the person that's kind of the glue of the organization. But if you've got that ability and you've been playing that role, if you can think of that in terms of a leadership role and how that can help to move the organization, then it can be very powerful. And then uh, the last of the styles is the democratic style. And I think uh, people probably understand this without much explanation. It's how much um, 
uh, in the exercise of our leadership, do we invite other people to not only uh, make decisions between alternatives, but to identify what those alternatives are? Um, and obviously that can, like any form of leadership, that's a form of leadership that can be overdone as well. There probably doesn't need to be a vote on what uh, kind of staples to order or um, how, how many uh, uh, rolls of masking tape. There are probably some things that you can just deal with without having to make it uh, a perfectly democratic exercise. Um, but it, it, it does a lot uh, to help people to feel that ownership over whatever it is that your organization commits people to do. Um, so I have talked a lot. Can we go to the next slide? But what I think would be helpful, and I'm not entirely sure how much time we have left. When does the session go until? We have half an hour. A half hour? Yeah. Well, and this should be plenty of time. Um, so what I'm hoping is that uh, I, I've thrown out uh, a lot of information uh, you know, thinking about leadership as something that is what's appropriate at this moment for this issue, this organization, or this set of people. Um, and th th that you can think about it in terms of what kind of issue are we dealing with, uh, what does the organization need, and then what do the people within that organization need. And I know it's an awful lot of information, but I was hoping that, at, that people at their tables could either think of one example to share or uh, if someone thinks they have a really uh, challenging leadership issue that they'd like to talk over uh, with everyone at the table, you could each decide. Um, but to just sort of uh, either share a little bit about something that you're confronting that's, that's an issue or an organizational challenge or something that you think uh, your, the members of your organization really need and, and just talk it through. Uh, of, you know, wh where are you providing the leadership? Is it on an issue, organization, or a group of people? Uh, what kind of challenge is it? Is it more technical, or is it a, this more kind of transformative, uh, adaptive change? Uh, is there some particular part of your organization that needs more attention, and is there some particular thing that the people in your organization uh, are most in need of? And what role are you playing or can you play? And do you feel that you need to identify other people within your organization uh, to exercise leadership that you can't necessarily exercise that isn't that natural for you? Uh, does that make sense? Yes. Almost. Almost. <laughs> well, and Maybe these people could move yeah. to some of the other tables. That's what I was, yeah. yeah. A any questions before we do that? I mean, it's basically just talking through issues that you have. Uh, and uh, either, and, and each, at each table you can decide which works better for you to each share what one of those issues are that you're dealing with, or uh, if figuring out if you just want someone to volunteer uh, a really uh, pressing issue that they'd like feedback on, and just going with that. I've got a question. You, yes. The organization you're referring to is Oh, your own. Just so within okay. your within your. I just want to know if it's Namo, yes. if it's Dark. You, I, I, you sort of didn't go there. That, that's a good point. I'm glad you raised that question. So, so yeah, it, it could be um, uh, a community issue uh, or a community association issue. It could be a, a state legislative issue. It could be a state HOA issue. Okay. What, whatever is really in your mind is is. You know, this is the important thing that we're really confronting now, and I'd like to share it and get some feedback. Uh, did you have a question? Oh, I guess not. Never mind. Okay. Uh, any other questions, or should we just uh, uh, go into the small groups? I'll take that as uh, no questions. Okay. Just so we can have a break and go on to the next session. And uh, just for you don't have to uh, overview everything that you talked about, but if you could pick someone and one interesting uh, issue that you talked about that you wanted to describe, basically what the issue is and what you view as what you might be doing next with that issue. So I'm hoping we can start at the table over there. Um, Tina was sharing with us a story about what's going on with her personally in her park and how um, almost desperate you would say 
that the park owner is to start evicting people so that they can turn it into rentals for profit. And uh, one of the stories that Tina shared was about a neighbor who was told, you either fix up your house in you know 60 days time or you're out of here. And it was an elderly woman, obviously with very limited resources, um, physically uh, unable to do things. Um, anyway, long story short, she did get evicted. Within the same week of her eviction, without having changed one twig on one tree, they rented. So, yeah, you lady have to fix up your house. But we, on the other hand, can just rent it again as it is obviously trying to get rid of her and succeeding, which is unfortunate. Um, another incident Tina mentioned was her own personal incident where she has a service dog and they are trying to evict her uh, because she has the dog. Even with doctor's letters documenting, it is a service dog. Clearly, that's a violation. Um, so of course, now it's her responsibility to get an attorney to represent her uh, Fair Housing Act. You can't, you know, it's, it's a, they're breaking the law. Mm -hmm. But what it shows us is that a lot of the park owners, and I'm sure there are some very good ones, unfortunately not where I live, but I'm sure there are. But it shows us that the park owners use these bully tactics and that we as community leaders in our own parks need to be aware that they use bully tactics and just because they're threatening and saying you have to or we're going to do this doesn't mean that they have the right to do that. And so I think especially when you're representing a 55 and over community, um, but in all of them, but particularly for the older generation that may be a little bit more easily intimidated, you need to be able to say to them, take a deep breath, we will figure this out, there are legal you know, courses we can take, and no, you're not gonna have to you know, sell a kidney to pay for it. We will, we, you know, there, is, there are avenues to pursue. And I think that's one of the biggest things we were kind of discussing was the bully tactics that these park owners think that they can get away with. And I think as, like I said, leaders of your particular communities, the best thing you can do is show people panic is not the answer. We will solve the problem. They are just bullies. Well, and that seems like a great exercise of a lot of different kinds of leadership, including uh, the visionary to, to let people know you can get through this uh, when people may not be feeling like they can. Right. So, great example. Uh, can we go to the table in the corner? Gee, look who we chose as the spokesperson. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> um, we talked a lot about the situation going on now about resurrecting an HOA that had been um, in you know, working in the past under crisis mode kind of went away and is now trying to reorganize and kind of the old guard versus the new guard and how the old guard sometimes has a hard time letting um, new, new leaders emerge even though they're not wanting to be the leaders <laughs> and how that, that that's really tough. And we talked a lot about leadership in the form of the majority of people that are really good leaders don't consider themselves leaders. Does everybody agree? Have you all seen that? The best, you know, the, the most, the strongest leader you've ever met would probably not have considered themselves a leader originally. And how you can go about that process of really discovering who has those leadership qualities and help that person grow. I think the most, you know, fun thing about an HOA is to watch people in all walks of life, you know, emerge and, and grow as a person and really be, you know, surprised by that. And so we talked about ways to really try to figure out who are the true leaders that keep their egos out and that you know don't have a, a problem with new people and what skill sets you need to do that. And so um, Tar Tara was talking about you know doing a, a kind of a, a grid of what is your skills, what have you done in life, you know those kinds of things. But with HOAs, we're all talking about all volunteers, right? 
So it's it's a different animal, and you also have to go beyond what the actual skill sets it are and see what motivates people to want to be involved, what motivates people to stay involved. Um, because you know you're volunteering. If you don't get something out of it, you're not going to continue to give and give and give. So you know I think that comes with one-on-one -on -one conversations a lot, and a lot of people are reluctant. But uh, how many people you know do you have in your communities that have never attended a meeting? But then a neighbor comes to them and talks to them individually about their feelings about a meeting or you know about what's going on in the community and they have a lot to offer and they end up having a better understanding through that one-on-one -on -one conversation and all of a sudden they get involved and they really emerge as a leader so i think we all have to take a look beneath the surface and the people that come up to the front forefront of things always are not necessarily your best leaders and it's really important to take that group and kind of dissect it and really take the time to do one-on-one -on -one conversations. Well, that seems like a, a great discussion about how leadership isn't just one thing. And I think that may be part of why the, the strongest leaders are the people who don't think of themselves as leaders because we're so conditioned to think that leaders are just one kind of person uh, as opposed to the many different skills and the many different approaches that we can all bring. Table in front. You don't want somebody who's not from Minnesota. Go for it. Our problem is making decisions. Yeah. That's probably why I'm not married. Yeah. And they're all wealthy. Um, I think what we, we're discussing here is personal experiences from a leadership position. We have people at the table that were leaders and have removed themselves and trying to work back, but they're still here. And I find that I've got a gentleman here that just got appointed in a leadership position and he's an extractor. And we, I counsel, I, I've run so many organizations on the leadership and the president. And I really love to sit in the back of the room and drive the bus from in the back. That's what I prefer. And if you believe that. <laughs> if I do my best, I, as a leader, I do my best work individually from an issue thing where I have the skills to, to drive and get the projects done. And and as a, I were in a state authority where I had nine board members, different parties, different genders, owners, homeowners and community owners. They're all leaders and you better get all the egos in place. So I look at, and I'm, I'm curious, like we have a lady here that, that works with Rock, which I've, helped, I've worked with buying a community. That's a different type of leadership. They're all different types and that's what I'm getting from this table. That there's no one type, and I agree with the table back there. It's, it's exactly what you said. And there is no one definition of a leader. Yeah. There is a definition of who accomplishes things. There's egos. They're not leaders. They're egos. And I think some of that we're finding is we're learning. That's what, how do you adjust for that individually and as a community and as an organization. A lot of it we've done in the past from my personal perspective is we try to set the rules and bylaws. Take it out of the hands of an individual and let the bylaws lead. That makes it a lot more comfortable situation with, with volunteers. That's pretty much it. I don't know if anybody else yeah. has There's only four that. minutes left, so maybe that's good for that group. Sure. <laughs> well, and to say that, though, that, that I think that's a great example of a person with a lot of skill and expertise. Uh, on the one hand, they could insist on uh, always being in the forefront, but on the other hand, it's also a person who's ideally suited for coaching leadership to, to, to work individually with people to pass along some of that skills and expertise that they have. Um, can we go to this table? Okay. I'm currently the president of the Bright and Barnegat HOA here in New Jersey. And for the first time, I have a person running against me for the president's position. And it's the first time I've ever been placed into this particular way of going. And I've always considered our Brighton and Barnegat as like a family style thing. 
uh, and this person is more regimented towards push, push, push. And so um, my people that are in the association with me want me to run. And as of now, I'm still uh, planning to leave my name on the nomination sheet, but I'm not positive that that's the best thing for me to do. So uh, it's just, uh, and we've just, I told you I guess yesterday that we have a new manager, park manager, so that makes this whole system change. And I'm a little bit concerned about if this group gets into all how forceful and are they gonna over push it. And the one thing that we're concerned about at Brighton is that all of these things that they're asking uh, to have done could result in capital improvement costs, which will come back to the members of the park to pay for that. And, and what happens is some of the members in the park don't want anything to do with some of these things, like fixing the pond area so you can walk around it, putting new, uh, a new pavilion in with an overhead enclosure so that we can have picnics once again. So uh, the one thing I'd like uh, Rita to identify to you was she she gave me a suggestion of what I think I might do. So Rita, if you don't mind, do that. No, no, we're running out of time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I can sort of shorten this and say Rita just said sometimes I think you have to let it go and let them go and see what happens. Yep. So that's my personal situation. I guess. Well, thank you. Uh, this front table here. Okay, I guess I'm on with you. <laughs> Our role, uh, and I have several board members here, is really coaching. And so we have a lot of different HOAs, probably much like Dave's group. And so we do that coaching. We've got a couple here that are trying to build the first resident association they have both renters and homeowners and uh, so their challenge is going to be getting an interest with both of those factions they also have a family park and so getting activities and things going for the kids that will pull the parents in to generate that excitement to get this organized so that was our suggestion to be able to do some things with the kids where they can pull the families in they may have to do two sets of activities some for the seniors and some for kids um, but it's going to be just feeling out how that goes until they get it built and off the ground which is a challenge thank you uh, in the back I'm from Florida. Uh, we have an issue at the fire hydrants in our park. No one could remember it being tested since 2004. And uh, we had no idea whether they even worked, even though there was areas where there was no fire hydrants. We tried to get the fire department in there to do some testing because the park owner would not, kept on saying they were tested but we couldn't find anybody in the park who could verify that. We tried the fire department, their issue was it was a private property and would not come in there unless the owners allowed them to come in. It took us about a year to convince them that they needed to test the pipes. Uh, they finally did, but by explaining to uh, the homeowners association to get people to get involved and aware that it was an issue that needed to be fought. Uh, we managed to get a number of people to volunteer and help out in getting these things resolved, which worked very good. So I would say we use like a democratic way of doing it and uh, telling them the whole story with everybody there. We didn't hide anything. That way they felt that they were involved. Thank you.
I was nominated by my entire table. <laughs> um, our two biggest issues were road repairs, which seems to happen quite frequently, um, that they, the roads need to be repaired and for whatever reason the owners of the parks are telling us they can't afford it or they're going to be doing it soon and we're not seeing that happen. And the other bigger issue was getting other homeowners and renters involved in the association so that we can band together and get the owners of the parks to do what they need to do. One of the things that we talked about is like in the state of Minnesota, you can give them a written notice and tell them you have this amount of time to fix this issue or to begin to fix this issue or these are the steps we're going to take. We're going to take you to court, we're going to put our rent in escrow instead of handing it to you, and then the, the court in the state of Minnesota will make them do it because as long as you're still paying your rent, it's going into escrow, as long as you're still paying it, they can't evict you. And then they have to fix the roads or whatever the other problem is if they want that money. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, and we're... Well, so thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. That was all sure. thinking on a Sunday morning. Not the easiest thing in the world, but we haven't quite solved all the problems in the world, but we're getting close to that. <laughs> so, um, ten minute break, and then uh, we'll be back for the next session. Please uh, be sure to fill out your evaluation forms and get them to me. I'm sitting at the back table. And um, uh, still coffee and juice, and there might still be some muffins and fruit. So, no